he came to her and asked her for support financially and also with his addiction. And she was like, no, 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 you're not an addict. You're not an alcoholic. It's your wife. She spends too much money. She's the problem. Sometimes the narcissist isn't our new partner, but someone in their family. Today, Rosanna Faye joined me to talk about what happens when you find that you have toxic in-law drama. And the self-help tip is how to create better couples boundaries so that you can protect the integrity of that relationship. One of the things we have not been talking about has been what happens when you marry into a family that's dysfunctional. Maybe your partner is healthy, maybe, maybe, maybe not, but you start to realize, and often it doesn't happen right away, but you start to realize that there's family dynamics happening in the background that's starting to interfere with your relationship and interfere with your life. Um, is this something that you experienced? I know I, I experienced some of it, and I also have watched a lot of people struggle with it. Yeah, absolutely. I've experienced it firsthand in my marriage, as well as, you know, heard of it from my clients that they struggle with it, especially with in-laws, siblings, your, your partners, your ex-partner siblings, um, but mostly in-laws. And it can be really challenging because there's this fine line that you need to kind of walk through to see, you know, what can you say? What can't you say? Is this appropriate? Is this not appropriate? And you're also stepping the boundaries of another person's family. So mm -hmm. that's tough. Yeah, because what we often don't think about is that a family is essentially like a mini culture. So when you join a family, and I, I don't think we emphasize enough to people when they get into a relationship, you're not just getting into a relationship with this person. You're marrying into this family. And that this family has a way of doing things. It's got traditions. It has ways of seeing things. It has certain values that may be radically different than yours. For example, I remember a friend of mine, a good friend of mine that you uh, see a lot. And so I got to watch the early part of her new relationship with her partner is that her family, her, it was his family actually, had a tradition that every person had to receive seven gifts at Christmas. That's kind of cute. Bring in in you know partners the kids as partners and then they start to have children and you times that by seven now you're talking about lots of gifts and lots of money and that cost of time there's the cost of money there's having to really know what would somebody want you know you go to effort and then maybe it's not really the greatest experience for the person so you kind of miss and creates and then that that for me would be really frustrating and I remember watching her running around circles trying to do this and every year sort of being exasperated, frustrated. And really, it's not her tradition. It really it, and it cost them a lot. And it, it was out of sync of her values. And I thought, yeah, that's really a great example of how tough it can be when even something innocent. I know that wasn't that family didn't mean to do any harm by that, but it was really adding a burden to a new couple to have to participate in this tradition. But it can get really bad. I mean, like fights over who spends where with holidays or or even when it comes to child rearing, you know, expectations around child rearing. I bet you you saw some interesting mm. stories as a doula even with that. Mm. Well, yeah, and I'll just talk a little bit about my own personal experience. As, as I started to have children, my ex's mom, so my ex mother-in-law, she had her own expectations of what motherhood looked like and what parenting looked like. And was very quick to giving me all sorts of advice. And as I started to kind of find my own way and then even share as a doula what I've learned in the community, being a doula and being with parents all the time, new parents, because, you know, 20, 30 years later, parenting has changed. And sharing with her some of what I've known, like some, some of the knowledge mm -hmm. that I've gained, she was very quick to shutting it down, showing me her way. You know, there was one time she asked me, why aren't you giving the baby any water? I'm like, because babies don't drink water. They, they drink breast milk. They drink milk. They don't need water. They get water from breast milk because that's what saturates them. That's what's going to hydrate them on a hot day. And I said, did you know that my, my milk actually gets a little bit more watery and it's diluted on a hotter day when I'm hot to hydrate my baby? And she was really upset about that. She, no, this is not what we do. We give a little bit of water. It's okay to give water to babies. You know, just like little things like that. Um, as I as I started to share with her some of the knowledge and she was kept shutting it down, I just stopped sharing. I just it didn't become a comfortable space to to be a new mom. Yeah. One of the things I also saw and it happened a little bit in my first marriage. It can be a competition between parents and the new partner where there actually it almost becomes a test of the adult child's alliance. Who is this person going to side with? Are they going to side with their parents? 
or they're going to side with their partner and can be a terrible bind when when you're feeling that pull. I, I know I certainly did. And it was really upset. I think even the part that upset me the worst was that my late husband couldn't see it in the beginning. He just saw it as innocuous or that I was reading things into things that maybe weren't really there. And I knew that I, you know, in fact, I even went out and asked other people what were their opinions. And they're like, oh, no, no, that, you know, that that's not very appropriate. So I know I wasn't, but it, it created tension for us and created um. Or even created arguments, like if there was a, something coming up that I may not have wanted to go to or it wasn't as important to me, I, I dreaded it. And then I, I felt that, that I, the hostility when I was there. And then I had to sort of then nurse my wounds when I got out of it. But for me, it was felt really, really lonely. I felt, yeah, I, to have my partner not get what I was experiencing and then to feel this, you know, this tension, this competitiveness just made it very, very isolating for me. I, I know that that's hard to see when you're when it's your family, you feel protective of your family. Yeah, it's the changing of reality, too, where you're you're almost conditioned by the in-laws or by their family. There's not a big deal. You know, you're you're making a big deal out of it or it's this is not what's really happening. It is appropriate. This is this is how they did it in the old days. This is this is just the relationship we have. This is a tradition we have. And because you feel a type of way about it, you're you know how you went out and you had to ask people like is this appropriate it was this correct you had to almost confirm your reality like am i experiencing this am i okay to feel this way am i okay to feel lonely left out isolated like i'm getting kicked out of the circle that's what it felt like for me sometimes i was getting kicked out of the circle you know there was there was one time that well a few times actually where you know the my ex mother in law would say oh you've built such a beautiful home to my ex husband this is such oh. a this is such a great home you've built, you know, for your wife, for your kids. This is your home. It wasn't our mm -hmm. home. It didn't feel like our home. It was his home. And it just felt like it was a jab at like, you're not the mom. You're not the new woman that's in this life. This has always been my my son, my house. And this is what he's built for you. That's what it felt like. Were you able to talk to him about that? I tried. But uh, near the end of our marriage, she was sick. And so everything was focused around, you know, her illness. She had hip surgery. She she was, you know, she was diagnosed and she went into remission and everything. You know, she was healthy. But for that period of time, for those, I think it was three or four years, it was a lot of like, well, she's sick. She yeah. doesn't need this right now. This isn't what's this is. It's probably the illness that's making her angry and making her like this. And it, it, it was just kind of we coasted around this whole her being sick and that every everything she said and everything she did as inappropriate and as wild and as ragey as it was, was just, no, she's sick. This is just my mom. This is how she is. She's not normally like this. And so, no, we didn't really get a chance to actually talk about it and how it made me feel. And that, that makes sense when you're having something serious like that, that certainly would derail and make everybody protective of that person too because of the because of the battling of with an illness my family's toxicity was such that i actually only considered dating certain types of men there are certain types of men that i knew wouldn't fit into the family dynamics and so i just knocked them out of the possible running oh because i i could yeah because i knew that they would be ostracized i knew that they would be heavily criticized behind their back i just i couldn't deal with the dynamics that i knew that i would be bringing my partner into when it came to my own family. I vetted them. That was one of the things I vetted them for. And I look back and I think, how sad is that? Because that didn't mean there it was a good match for me. I was just trying to make sure it wasn't going to be a toxic matchup for my for me dealing with my family context. So I was aware that my family was unique and 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 quirkiness and and was going to be challenging to be a part of. Interestingly enough, my parents loved Brad a whole lot. They really adored him. He did fit in really well. So it, thank goodness that wasn't an issue. Now, I didn't fit in with his family and there was a lot of problems for us over the years. And for most of our marriage, he didn't see it and kind of gaslit me around it, which really, really hurt. But near the end, and it was just before he got ill, we went to a family event and he, for some reason, had more clarity at that family mm -hmm. event. I don't know why. I, I even remember watching him watch me and then he got in the car and he was livid. He started dissecting the dynamics and was so angry. And I'm thinking, but dude, I've been dealing with this for, what, 30 years. This is not anything new. 
this is just what they've always done. But I, I have to say it was so validating, so validating to have him finally see it. And, you know, I felt like literally it, as if the family created a circle and then we had our own circle. You know, think of like the relationships, the connections. So there's the family of his and then there's my family and then there's ours. And hopefully you think that they should reasonably overlap. There should be this nice fit as we sit in the center of these two different circles. The problem is it, it didn't happen. And, and what I often felt with him is that he sat inside of his family circle, whatever we were with them, and that I lost our relationship connection. And then when we get back in the car, and we because usually it was a three-hour ride home because they weren't close, there would be an effort to sort of mm. reconstitute our connection. And then he would sort of slowly, as we kind of got closer to home, would slide closer to our family circle. But I hated the loss. I mean, it really felt like I was losing him every time we visited the family. Did you feel like you were losing your partner as well? Not losing my partner, losing myself. It was, I just kind of lost myself in his family. I grew up like really, just everyone was just really open to, you know, I think it's Filipino culture is that everyone is your family. Everyone is auntie. Everyone is uncle. Everyone's your cousin. Like we're all open and welcoming to all sorts of different cultures and people. And I didn't feel like that with my ex's family. I felt like once you were in the inner circle, you were in. And they had little little dynamics that I just wasn't a part of. Yeah. So it felt like I was just being enmeshed into their, into their culture, their, you know, their tradition. Christmas is really big for them. It wasn't as big for us. We're more just about food and gatherings where they're about the gift giving and the traditions and, and making sure that you know, everybody was, everybody got what they wanted. It wasn't relaxing. It was just very scheduled. And so anytime I was with my ex's family, it was very much like I was having to put on this little show, this little act of being this perfect wife. Mm. And so I would lose myself. For my family, my comfortable, laid back kind of attitude, that wasn't me when I was with them. Yeah. And that, that part was really frustrating. Yeah, 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 that's, that's interesting. And then, you know, what's interesting also is that What's also you and I are doing that's different is that your partner was also struggling and had, had his, you know, personality issues. And you, you know, said he's pretty narcissistic. My late husband, I would say, was selfish, but he was also a really good guy in a lot of ways. He had really great qualities. And we could talk about that. So I came from, you know, a decent relationship. And then I got into the narcissistic relationship. And so, yeah, it was interesting because he didn't mean to be hurtful, but it was hurtful. And, it, and I think that's the part that we often don't understand as partners when we marry into these relationships is that we think that our one who's been living in it should see it. They should see the toxicity and you think that they should be they should be protective of you, that they would have a, a better alliance with you. But they don't always see it because this is this is all they've ever known. They may not even have a good perspective of what else it could be. I'm thinking like, I've met your mom, for example, and you're right. She's super open, very easy to be around. And she makes everybody feel like you're part of the group. It's, it's true. And I bet your ex may not have realized that his family was very clicky and that, that, was, that there was an in and out. I know that that's what was the case for my late husband. He didn't, he didn't know. Now, here's the other interesting thing that happened with my, my, the second who was very, very narcissistic is that his family was great and I loved them. I actually really, really liked them. What, and I thought we had a great connection and it wasn't only until the relationship was over that I discovered they had been in on the deception. They're good at playing. They're yeah. good at playing these roles, aren't they? Exactly. That they knew, I mean, he'd lied to me about some things and they played along. Um, they kind of had a lay of a land with him. You know, they, they had, they, I didn't know at the time when I met them that they had just met this other girlfriend. They were aware of her. And then in the middle of it, when he brought her into town or during our breakup, they did things with her and that they were actively a part of, of the deceptiveness that that so this warm and the sweetness that I thought I was experiencing with them was just part of the duplicity. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily sincere, but I, I thought it was sincere and I really, really liked them. And then when we got back together, she started to get snippy with me. It wasn't so nice because she lived with us. I don't know if you knew that. She lived with us for eight months and uh, she would start to complain about me. And I remember saying to him, well, you brought another girlfriend in here. You kind of you kind of undermined my position with her. So, yeah, of course she doesn't respect me because you showed me disrespect. Are we surprised? I remember he even saying, She's upset that you don't like her. And I said, wait, 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 wait. My issue with her has never been an issue. There is no issue. She's creating one. I'm not participating in this issue. 
If there is an issue, it's an issue you have with her over what you've done. But I'm not getting into this. He tried to place it on you. Mm-hmm. She did too. And I'm like, Mm-mm, no, we're not. We're not doing this. I, I know it. This is triangulation. I don't have any. I, my feelings for her have never changed. Um, I'm not doing anything different. What's been different is you. You're different. And then you need to own this burden. I'm not owning it. Yeah, it can get tricky. And I know that when I, people talk about this, it's often they come in and I bet you hear this as a coach too. They come in and they want solutions like make this in-law stop asking for these ridiculous things or unreasonable things or how come they can't see that this is not fair what do you do when you hear that yeah well that a lot of those questions come from a why like why do they do this why mm-hmm. are they um not taking my side why is this um becoming an issue well i think that the the biggest thing is it's not about the why it's about what are you going to do next it's about how are you going to yeah. how are you going to calm your nervous system for this how are you going to change your perspective on this or your perception of what this actually is, which is another sick woman or another person that is unhealthy in somebody else's family that's trying to get you to do something that you're not comfortable with? That's just what it is. It has nothing yeah. to do with who you are, how you parent, how you, mu- how, how you are as a wife or as a partner. It has nothing to do with you. It's everything to do with them and their unhealthy dynamics. So I try to get my clients to separate themselves from the issue Mm -hmm. and look at it from a different perspective just look at it like this isn't what you're like yes you're experiencing this but this isn't what is actually happening this is from their experience and their view of things yeah I love that you're pointing out that a lot of this is projection and that's being played out with them I think the other vulnerability and I know this was certainly true for me but I think it's also true for a lot of other people we go into these relationships with needs and some of us may even have our own mother hunger or father hunger and we hope that this family is going to be our new second family you know that first of all that's a tall order it's a tall order to put even on the healthiest of families and I I think it really comes back to that we need to look at what our expectations are and to realize this is a just as if we were to go to a whole new country and we'd have to learn the rules to the new country we really need to learn the new rules to this family and, and that, that there may be mismatches in things that don't quite line up or things that we wish we could get that we're not going to get. But that doesn't sometimes that means the family's not healthy, but sometimes that just means our expectations too big or in the wrong direction. Yeah. Different from yours. Yeah, exactly. Right? Different from what you've you know been brought up with. And so, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is just realizing that it's different. I wish I had these tools back then. I wish I had these tools when I was married because there were many times where, you know, you bring up triangulation where my mom actually and my ex's mom got into a tip Mm. over money that I was spending on my hair, nails, lashes, whatever money that I made, of course. And this was a perfect, perfect opportunity for my ex to come in and swoop in and say, see, my mom sees it. Your mom sees it. You spend way too much money. And, you know, I've shared this with you before that a big issue in my marriage was over money coming from somebody who I was, I was married to somebody who's a gambling addict, who spent a lot of money on substances, who is, you know, still probably struggling with addiction. And so the, the consumption, like always spending money and always just frivolously being, that was something that he tried to pin on me. And that was a clear projection. And then just a really great example is just him reaching out to my mom and then having the two moms come together concerned about my spending. And my ex-mother-in-law was just so about it. She just loved the drama. She just loved it, especially because he came to her and asked her for support financially and also with his addiction. She was like, no, 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 you're not an addict. You're not an alcoholic. It's your wife. She spends too much money. She's Mm. the problem because she couldn't look at her own son and say, you know, the addiction is something that we can address. It became her problem. So she's like, no, it's not my yeah. problem. It's got to be hers. Yeah. So this is, it was, it was, it was, it got nasty and really messy near the end. And I wish I had tools just to know that these family dynamics, they are different. They have nothing to do with you. Yeah. And they are a projection. Yeah. And sometimes you make another really good point. Sometimes the more toxic a person is, the more dysfunctional they are in their thinking, then the more likely they are going to be not only competitive, and envious, but they also may want to destroy you. Mm-hmm. That's you what know? it felt like. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I hear. That, that thing story really, I could feel the, the effort to kind of get rid of you or at least to throw you, you know, certainly threw you under the bus, but she, 
<clears throat> yeah, exactly. Exactly. People often want to know what to do. So let's move into some self-help suggestions. I, I think there's maybe more than just one tip. There's several that we're going to talk about that are going to be really, really useful. And then, uh, but one of the things that I find super helpful to remember is that it is a new environment that you're moving into and that this is, has a long history. We often forget that because we know our own immediate, I mean, you're the outsider coming in. You know what you wish would happen and you know that the relationship you're trying to build with your partner and whether your partner is dysfunctional or not dysfunctional or a little bit dysfunctional, you're really still hoping to have a connection with them. But they also are, at the same time, are trying to balance the connection with they have with their family. And so sometimes in a competitive situation, families will make it an either or. They'll say, if you align with your new partner, then we see that as a threat, then you're not choosing us. And they'll actually kind of make it an either or situation. That's tough because that person is being put, the person who stands in the center between their own family and then their new partner it's being put in the position of having to choose, and they shouldn't have to choose. I think the degree that we cannot worsen it is really great, but that's hard not to when you've got someone actively working against you in the other family. That makes it really hard. You know, they're saying you're the enemy, and then you're saying, I don't want to be, I don't want to act like an enemy. It's very hard to stay out of the enemy role when you've got somebody characterizing Placing you, you there, yeah, yeah exactly. putting you right in that spot. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think another thing, too, to remember is that we're grown up. The, the way we grew up, the way our upbringing is, is very different. It's like building up something like a structure, a house, yeah. and then joining with somebody else who's built up their house very different. And we try to, like, put them together, like, all the pieces of this house together into one. Yeah. And it's too much. It's It's, you know, you can't put all of the pieces into one big house. So I think having the things that work in in yours and the things that work in theirs and just meshing them together and picking what works well and leaving some of the rest behind like we don't have to have the tradition of seven gifts if it doesn't work with your family financially or the commitment of it we don't have to have um you know this mindset where you have to do everything your family says to a, to you yeah. know just because that's how you grew up so I think having a discussion with your partner in healthy dynamics and really laying that out of what is our house going to look like? What is our family going to look like? What worked in your upbringing? What worked in mine? And then put it together to make your own. I think that's really important to just have that. And I know this is not going to work for toxic relationships, but in healthy dynamics, yeah. coming from toxic or maybe sometimes toxic upbringings that you just really work together to, to build something and create something for yourself. I can already hear what some people are going to say. They're going to say, though, so let's imagine that you're the person who's got the toxic family and you now you have a new partner and there's this tension growing and your partner says, well, what do we want to do? Let's use the seven gifts as a Christmas gifts as an example, because it's just an easy one. They say, well, what do we want to do? What are, our what are our values around Christmas and Christmas giving? Maybe we don't even want to give gifts. So we decide that we don't want to. And that the person who ends up being raised in that, like, but it's special to her or it's special to him or it's special to my family. And you're going to really make them upset. And what am I supposed to say to them? And you know what? Now we're they're going to say we're ruining their holiday. We're ruining this, this special tradition that they've always had. And I think it was super hard because sometimes that's the position we're put in where it, it literally is a no win. And I think those are the times where it really comes back to if you're the person who's caught between your new partner and your family for you to realize where does your allegiance really lie? I mean, do you want the marriage to work? Do you want this real partnership to work? Because if you keep choosing your family, it ultimately won't. Partner is going to feel like you have betrayed them. But I also know that may mean you're costing your relationship with your family, at least a good relationship with your family. And the more toxic the family is, the more they're going to make you choose. And it may mean you're going to lose that connection that you once really, really enjoyed. And I think the hard thing for the person who's joining this situation is that we often have a different timeline, how we want this healing and this process to go. We want our partner to be on our side right away from the get-go. And I'm not saying they shouldn't, but the more this is an entrenched process, the more it's heavily dysfunctional. And the younger they are and the less firm they are in their identity, you're, that's a tall order. That they're going to really struggle to do that. So you may have to see this as something that changes incrementally over time. Now, should I have been patient with my late husband and let it be, take 30 years for him to sort of say, yeah, that's not good. I don't like what happened there. No, I'm, I'm, I think that was, I was very long suffering. 
But on the other hand, it may not happen in a week or a year either. Yeah, I agree with that. It definitely takes time. It takes many conversations, maybe not one conversation to kind of get things started. But it's also maybe a yearly reevaluate of where your values are. Maybe you sit down and, and do goal setting with your kids and see if things change. Maybe the seven gifts a year works until you have three kids. Yeah, right. And you no longer can afford to do that. Um, and maybe it shifts. And it's also a conversation with the family as well. I agree. I agree. I think that's a really a great. Yeah, I totally agree. So in the podcast extra, let's jump over and shift. And let's talk about what if you really know you have a narcissistic in-law. For sure. Not just you have a challenging dynamic that you can tell that you have an in-law who is deliberately setting things up or undermining you, maybe even even playing things against you. What should you do about it? So we're going to hop over and talk about that. But thank you so much for joining me today on this podcast. I'm so pleased to have you here again. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap for this week's episode. Are you following me on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube? Find me at Carrie McAvoy PhD. Now you don't need to wait a week to get your next podcast fix. Join Breaking Free from Narc Abuse at Substack.com to get exclusive audio content for subscribers. To sign up, click the link in the show notes. And whether you're in, consider leaving, or have left a narcissistic relationship, find community support at my Toxic Free Relationship Club. You can learn about this resource as well as others at CarrieMcAvoyPhD.com. And I'll see you back here next week. Thank you.